And welcome to another Around the Rotary with me, your host, J.P. Warren. And thank you for tu- everyone for tuning in right now. And uh, I got to I gotta start off like this, like I normally do. That Around the Rotary podcast is brought to you by Capital Patron Consultants, CPC Specialized in Project Engineering, well site Supervision, all disciplines of the oil and gas industry. Contact us through www. You don't want two W's on that. You want three W's. Dot Capital Patron Consultants.com to see what CPC can do for you today. And today in the studio with us, we got uh, Brandon Buzzer, Buzzard? Buzzard. Buzzard. Yeah. There you go. All right. The Vice President of Global Business Development at Lamore, uh, Lamore Corporation yeah. from Finland. That's right. That's where the company is based out of. And we have, you brought a very nice gift of Finlandia, uh, vodka of Finland. I appreciate that. I know we're bourbon central here around the Rotary, <laughs> but you know what? We welcome, uh, we welcome other types of uh, gifts too. So thank you for that. Welcome. Being a listener to the podcast, I figured you needed to change it up. Just I need to change bit. it up a little bit. Yeah. It's not a bad thing to change things up, yeah. especially this day and age. So yeah. how are you doing today? Doing wonderful. And uh, first of all, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, you're a great uh, voice for the industry. Oh, uh, you've been a blast to listen to. You've got a lot of great variety on here and uh, just happy to be here. It's been fun. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's you know, people are like, oh, like, you know, what's the goal? What's the goal? I'm like, you know, the goal is just to kind of sit around the table and shoot the shit with people and just to, just to get to know them a little bit better, get to know the the person behind the position. You, you know, I was, I was thinking about you because when Joe Rogan sh- sold his podcast to Spotify yeah. you know, for $100 million, he went back to his first podcast. And when he first announced this whole thing, he had two likes on, you know, Twitter or whatever it was about his podcast. That's it. Ten years later, hundred million dollar deal with you know Spotify. So, so you never know. Great where, things start small. If the oil if the oil field dries up, you never know. In ten years, I might be doing something with Spotify. You, you never got the know. radio voice. I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. So, so you're uh, we. So this is the first time that you and I are sitting across the table to be right. talking. And uh, before we started this, you kind of uh, just talked about that you're third generation oil field. Correct. Kind of a uh, not a military brat, but an oil field brat. You moved around every three years and all that stuff. But let's get this kicked off like normal. I, I, give me your background. Like, where are you from? Like, what's your you know where what's, where you been? What's your experience? Would let's 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 get it going. Absolutely. So I, I think everybody thinks they have a unique story. Uh, but I, I feel but like you know what's interesting. A lot of people, I'm like, hey, you want to come on the podcast or something like that? And they're like, ah, I don't have a story. Everyone has a story. That's the thing. 100%. Everyone has a story. So go on. Well, I, I happen to think I have somewhat of a story because I've got a unique background. My, as you said, <clears throat> I'm third generation oil field. Uh, both my grandparents worked for operators in Malaysia uh, for most of their careers. What years were that? Oh, God, this is uh, in 50s, 60s, 70s. That's crazy. So, yeah, they, they basically went overseas. Uh, at the time, Americans weren't, there weren't a lot of Americans in Singapore and in Malaysia. Uh, so both my grandparents on either side kind of pioneered being American operators in Malaysia, um, which is a whole other story uh, we get into. But it was a completely different city, too, at the time. I mean, Singapore wasn't probably built yet. You now, Singapore was, it was, was just coming up. Uh, you know, especially Malaysia was was very third world, uh, very out. They didn't like a lot of outsiders. Okay. Going to Malaysia. Okay. So, uh, you know, some of the more maverick Americans, like my grandparents, went over there to to try to try to stimulate that that oil production and uh, and find some wells that were okay. pretty famous. Uh, long story short, though, by living in Malaysia, what the the parents of the expats would do would bring all their college kids over and they would put them on the beach at Bali for a summer to celebrate, you know, and, and kind of relax. Yeah. And so you have a diverse group of people that are all going to college in the states. And my dad was at the time going to Mississippi State. Okay. My mom was a working actress in New York. Like film or, uh, or uh, theater? Theater, and uh, and she was in a show, uh, Perry Mason, back in you know, back in the day. You don't so. have to say, like, I don't know Perry Mason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so she was, uh, she, was, she was working her way up. She was taking film uh, lessons from Lee Strasberg, who's a super Lee famous Strasberg. guy. Yeah, so she's she wanted to be an actress. My dad was a fraternity guy at Mississippi State. And uh, one thing that beautiful beaches do to almost everybody in the world is they give you a common denominator, right? So... My mom uh, meets Country Boy uh, on a beach, a yep. beautiful beach in Bali, and uh, they kick off their relationship, and and that evolves into uh, getting married. So her parent, her parents were in oil field as well too. Yeah, both okay. sides. Okay, both sides. So yeah, they they uh, they they meet. Uh, I come along a few years later, and uh, my dad goes to work for a drilling contractor immediately after college. Okay, uh, which was called Reading and Bates. <clears throat> now many times over, that would be what's called Transocean today. Yeah. Okay, Reading and Bates is. Transatlantic Forex and Falcon, and then eventually Transocean. Was did, did he get a uh, petroleum engineer degree? Nope. He, uh, he he went hard knocks. So okay. uh, he, he, he started off as a roughneck offshore. Yep. So I lived in Borneo, Sarawak, Singapore, 
uh, you know, all over Malaysia. Yeah. And then stateside, I've lived in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, Denver, Colorado. And then finally, when my dad earned his way into the office, we landed here in Houston. How was that growing up as a kid, just bouncing around? Well, I think, I think it taught me to sell. I mean, if you're going to make friends every three years, you know, you better be able to jump into a brand new environment. Right. And you better be able to talk about other people's lives and, and, and bring context quickly. So, you know, while it's not ideal to move around every three years, I think it's good because, you know, you, you have a lot of exposure to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, though. If, if you, again, it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of like uh, whatever lenses you wear, whatever, I mean, if you go in a situation, whether it's moving around or whether it's a new job or whether it's whatever, mm-hmm. you can either look at like, oh, shit, change is bad. I don't want to do this uh, or I don't want to move or I don't, these new kids, they got their own clicks or just what you said, you can kind of change it and kind of look at it as a opportunity. Right. And it's also survival, too. When you're when you're younger and you come into these various cliques and these groups, yeah. uh, you know, you, you've got to pretty much figure out what do you uh, what do you add to the group and, and how can you get in there? So uh, so it was it was interesting. I went to a, like a Dutch school when, okay. I, was in, uh, when I was in Malaysia. Uh, I went to a private Catholic school when I was in Denver. So I, I had all these different types of kids that I was around growing up, and uh, it gave me a lot of experience with, with people in general. Okay. And understanding. All right. So you just, you just, I guess, jumped around. Could you do sports or anything like that, moving around so much? Yeah. So I was, I was big into martial arts okay. since I was a kid. What, jiu-jitsu, uh, karate? Uh, all of it, yeah. So uh, taekwondo, jiu-jitsu. Oh, really? Got into MMA when I was a little bit older. Have you seen the new season of uh, Cobra Kai? <laughs> yeah, I have. I haven't seen the new season, by the way. Cobra Kai is more. Oh, I'm sorry, not, not the third season. But yes. I've watched both the previous. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's. Yeah. Un- I mean, the, the fact that like Daniel Larusso grows up, and it kind of goes with the theory that he is the bully. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, good for Johnny to start his own thing. But I haven't seen season three yet, but I pr- plan on watching it. So anyway, go back. The, the per- perspective in that show, when when you do see. Uh, the other side of hey, you know that guy was sitting on my girlfriend on the beach. What I do you want me to do? You know, my, it was my last. It was my last year. I don't. I just wanted to graduate. It, it's it's such a great uh, it's a great play that there are no bad people. You yeah, know, I'm sure there's bad perspectives or different perspectives, but yeah, no, it's an amazing show. So so you're in, so you're in martial arts. Yeah. Okay. Did, did martial arts. Uh, taekwondo was pretty much my thing when I was you know jumping around quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and that kind of gave me some central, uh, activities that I could always depend on. Taekwondo is the same in every country, every state. So you can go, no matter where you went, you, you had the, the group of the common, of the common interest and the common sport of, uh, Taekwondo. Yeah, it's kind of like religion. If you go to Catholic church, it's the same. Right. Everywhere. Right. Taekwondo. You can pop in anywhere, any city and, it's, and you expect the same thing. Pretty, pretty yeah. much. Okay. Same. Until I, I landed here in Houston, more or less Katy, and then I was exposed to, you know, Katy football. Mm-hmm. Um, I, Let's clarify that. I went to Taylor, not Katie. Which when did you graduate? Uh, Nineteen ninety-nine. So do you know Jason Stewart? I do. Yeah. Yeah. R.J. Moses. Yeah. Marcel Meyer. I heard of him. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, all those cats were now buddies with. Okay. All right. Jason was on the show uh, a couple weeks ago, actually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so so I went to Katie Taylor, um, and then I saw what football was there, and my eyes got wide, and uh, I jumped right in. Played football, uh, ran track, wrestled. Um, and really got into the sports side of, okay. uh, of of Texas, which was non-existent, not not to this level. It's, else. it's a di- it's a different uh, it's a different environment when you get to Texas. I mean, I grew up in Connecticut. I mean, uh, it was it was big but not huge. Down here, you come here, it's, it's it runs towns. It's a religion, yeah. Oh yeah, and it's uh, and it's something that I fully wanted to be a part of. And okay, having sports in my in my uh, obviously in the high school level was. Uh, was wonderful for me and development. And I think, I think everybody should compete. And, uh, out here, especially if you can compete, it was, uh, it's a good man maker, you know, going into your, your college. Okay. All right. So you, so you go to college. Yeah. Go to college. Uh, you know, I, I, I moved around every few years. I I thought, you know, I I don't want to basically do what my dad did. He was gone a lot. Uh, you know, I don't want my future family to have to jump from city to city. So So you were kind of turned off about the oil field a little bit. I wasn't wasn't turned off to it. I just knew it was a lot of work. I mean, the the stuff that my dad had to do offshore to get inside the office was, was, I wasn't work avert, but it just seemed like a a, a very, uh, back in those days, the the clear line into the office was you had to go earn your stripes in a major way. A long time. Gotcha. But, uh, you know, so being in Houston, I was also exposed to, you know, the great portfolio of restaurants we have here. Yep hospitality. I was really into fitness. So I figured hospitality, fitness, wellness, that's going to be my thing. Okay. And uh, we just happened to have the U of H Conrad Hilton School here at uh, U of H, which is the best, you know, hospitality school in the nation. Okay. And uh, I figured I'd go there, uh, get a degree for what's worth, and um, and then it'd become like the next Tillman Fertitta. You know, that was my goal. All right. Uh, 
was successful at a couple different brands. Uh, took a health and wellness brand out of uh, Houston and, and promoted it in San Diego. So I got to live in California in my early twenties. Cool. When it was cool, yeah. Yeah, it's it always sunny in uh, it's always sunny in uh, San Diego. It's always sunny in San Diego. It's a beautiful place. Kind of changes as you get older. Okay. But, you know, as your young twenties, mid twenties. So did you enjoy that? I loved it. Yeah, okay. I absolutely loved it. I mean, who if you get past some of the things that people don't like about the politics there and and, and various other right. detractors like taxes. And when you're not making a ton of money, it's not that big of a deal. So, um, you did, know, with, did you like that industry though? Yeah, I, I did. I, I, I liked helping people. I liked wellness. Uh, you know, follow your passion is what people tell you to do. And uh, I thought that that would be my biggest way to make an effort and significantly impact other people's lives was through the wellness hospitality right. aspect. Uh, but you know, that's all good until things change when you get married, obviously, and then when you have a kid. So, had a kid coming, right. and I thought about. You know, this, this hospitality thing is a hustle. It's very cyclical. And it's ironic that I jumped out of hospitality to get into the oil and gas industry. Which is a more stable environment. Which is more stable right. than, uh, than, uh, than hospitality and, uh, <laughs> and health and wellness, which is kind of funny when you, when you look at it that way. Uh, but no, I, I got back to, uh, I, got, I got an interview with NOV. Uh, at that time, they were gobbling up companies like crazy. And well, so hold on. Let's, 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 let's take a yeah, pause real sure. quick because you're, 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 in, you're in San Diego. You yeah. get your child on the way. Yep. Uh, you're living out there. You, you're doing okay. You're enjoying yeah. it. And then right. suddenly you're like, okay, my child's on the way. I'm going to jump into oil, why oil and gas number one. Right. And for what were you applying and for? How? So, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that is a big, so uh, dad was always in oil and gas. Okay. So after getting through the contractor side, he went and worked for the operator. He was, uh, he had his own company that worked for BP. Okay. So, my conversations with my father and the rest of my family, for that matter, were always oil and gas centric. You know, I could talk the language of what was happening. I knew, uh, you know, what was happening on land. I knew what was happening offshore. That was the you basic. Grew up around it. I grew up. Right. It's in my. It's in my blood. I wasn't working in the industry, but that was my. Those were my water cooler conversations with gotcha. my father, so to speak. So, uh, you know, I was living in a 900 square foot loft that, if I were to buy it, would be as much as any big house out here right. in in, uh, in Katy, let's just say. And I was looking at the economics of living in California long term, uh, earning potential. And, uh, you know, I just I started getting dissuaded from how am I going to raise a kid out here? What am I going to do long term out here? Uh, you know, when you're in these tier one markets, everybody's pretty much hustling for a new thing every three years. It's it's how can you stay on top? How can you pay the bills? There's really not a lot of industry in sounds, San Diego. Sounds exhausting. Yeah, there's, there's, you got the military, and then yeah. you've got lawyers, but there's not a big, you know, hydrocarbon processing plant, you know, in San Diego. That's why it's a beautiful. So place. you're you're constantly thinking about that. What's the, what, what what can I latch on to this every three years to kind of grow, grow, grow? You, you you have to grow that. You know, when I was out there in 2007, we had you know the market tanked. You see everybody that was in the subprime mortgage game who was you know living in million dollar apartments driving. You know, German cars right. that were, you know, 22 years old. You saw all those guys go away quickly. Uh, and that impacted, obviously, restaurants and health and wellness brands. Oh, yeah. So it, it, the combination of getting married, having a kid, seeing the, the economy tank uh, made me ask myself some hard questions about what I wanted to really do. Um, and at this time, my dad still had a connection to NOV. Okay. Uh, he, he had, a, he had a, a soft sell to get me into the offshore projects group in terms of just an interview. Just okay. Come talk to my son if you know he's got no relative experience in the, at NOV, but he he is a hustler, and you guys are looking for hustlers at this at this at this particular moment. And uh, I was able to talk to a great guy named Bill Kent, who um, looked at my resume, kind of smiled, and said, "Well, you know, sink or swim, I'll, I'll give you a shot, but uh, you know, nothing's guaranteed." Okay. And uh, that's how I got into NOV. Had so, so did you move from San Diego to Houston once you landed the job? Yes. Okay. That's right. All right. So. So that was the the emphasis of coming back. Plus, uh, you know, proximity to grandparents. My my, my family's all out here in Katy and Houston. Oh, once so, you have that, once you have that baby, it helps out. Once you get it's free babysitting right there. That's right. They yeah. become they become the people that you see on the holidays, the people you want to see every day because that gives you yeah. some sort of respite. So uh, so yeah, no, we 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 were we wanted to get back closer to family. I wanted to get into an industry that I could kind of dig my toes into or heels into, so to speak. And uh, that's what brought us back here. And so you you applied for the offshore 
So I wasn't great at math and science. So I, that's one of the aversions to the oil and gas industry. I, right. I, I, thought, I'm not, yeah. I thought, I'm not going to be an engineer. You know, <laughs> uh, Nothing supports my, uh, my scholastic <laughs> you uh, both. trajectory here. So, um, uh, so yes, it, ironically, I end up into a, a projects group full of great engineers. I mean, offshore projects at the time was when NOV had a backlog that was, you know, a mile long. Yeah. And the drilling, offshore drilling space was just going on fire. So... Uh, I ended up in a very engineering heavy um, group with a lot of really smart people. And what was interesting about that is, you know, had I landed in another group, I wouldn't have learned the products nearly as well. But I had to sit there and learn every single product, how it fit into the drilling rig, uh, the process of, you know, uh, the, the, the project management process, uh, basically everything that, that I needed to learn to have a technical prowess in this industry, I got to learn. In the offshore projects. Group. I think we just had someone on that said, you know, uh, I always try to be the bottom five in the, in, the, in the room. You know what I mean? I don't want to be the smartest person. I want to be the bottom five. That way you learn the most. That was the bottom one. Yeah. Room, okay. Yeah. Sure. All right. So you so you go from a, a hospitality, wellness, uh, environment industry, and now you're plunged into NOV offshore. So what was that, I guess, culture shock for you? But Or did you just grow up around it so it was no big thing? No, I, it was culture shock in terms of an office culture. So, you know, my 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 roles previous was it, they were my brands or I was a general manager of a brand. Okay. I could come in, go freely. It was, it wasn't so structured, but coming into a, you know, the cubicle life, you know, with, with office culture, I had never done it. Before. Okay. So, you know, I, I thought it was kind of cool that my name was on a cubicle. That was, you know, it felt like it was cool for ride. three days. And you're like, get me out of the office. And I was like, this is kind of <laughs> tiny. And, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, it was an intimidating environment for me and I had to work a lot harder to understand the products because I was obviously not uh, not accustomed to putting them together, yeah. and this was not an environment either that that was forgiving on on lag time. We we, we were super busy. I was a I was a headcount ad. I was expected to you know jump in and start producing you know fairly quickly. Okay. So uh, so I spent a lot of time working as hard as I could. I, I might have been the bottom in the room, but I was the hardest worker for sure. Okay. And uh, and you know by working hard and taking projects that were were, were extremely challenging for me. Learned a lot, but I also met a lot of people. And uh, what's great about NOV is it, it becomes your own, you know, you can sink or swim within NOV very easily. And uh, half of your job is internal networking for sure. And I met some great people at NOV that eventually saw that if I could do this in this group, you know, why don't we try them in other things? Yeah. And that's sort of. Well, that's, I mean, that's what's cool about NOV. I mean, you, you meet a lot of people in our industry that, that are in new different roles now, but they all, yeah, there's a lot of people that have that common experience of being in NOV. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's making those networks and making those connections, and next thing you know, they branch off to do that spider web where it's yeah. like, okay, this person's over here. I think that's a cool experience just to have that network and just kind of see people's careers start evolving elsewhere, you know? It's a wonderful place to land, and, and, and you know, that was by pure luck. I could have landed at any other vendor. Right. Uh, which would have probably been bought by NOV at some point during the time I was, yeah. I was there. But uh, no, NOV was a, it's a fantastic place to get your basis. And, right. uh, and really, it was a fantastic place to be a part of a super winning team. I mean, NOV at the time under Pete Miller was just uh, was on fire. And it was cool to see the industry at that stage and, and really get a taste. And be a part of it, a, a, a team during that during that time. Part of the team during a boom. You know, yeah. not everybody's got to see that as of late. A lot of guys are graduating now. And they came right into the 15 market, you know, where which we haven't recovered from. We haven't recovered no. from. So they've never seen what this industry is like when it's, you know, blowing again. Yeah, triple digit, you know, oil prices. We're gonna get there. I don't know if we'll get there, but I think we'll recover to a, to a more sustainable place. It'll be more, more fun in the industry versus a uh, uh, nerve wracking. I, I think. I mean, everybody says it all the time, and you know, we should listen to our own advice. What goes up goes down. What goes down goes up. I think we've been in a trough. Long enough to where I think we'll start to see some trends that will. All right, all right, all right. Well, you're hearing it. You're hearing it now and uh, around the rotary, and this is you can take Brandon's word that's, for it. So okay, that's, a, that's my educated uh, estimation. So you're so, NOV, uh -huh. learning, learning, keep going. Yeah, so uh, learning, and I figured that uh, maybe my long-term lifespan within the projects group wasn't going to be great. Okay. Again, I wasn't the best at what I did there. Maybe a harder worker. But, uh, you know, I had guys from, you know, MIT engineers that were next to me that were able to put entire drilling packages together in their head and then go talk to the, you know, project manager about yeah. the various, you know, uh, issues with doing so. For me, I had to have every brochure, every product line manager explaining to, explain it to me like I was a two-year-old on how this product worked together. So I figured I need to, I need to do the best I can in this group, but I also need to network into something where I could use my skills and 
maybe more of a sales customer okay. focus. Uh, uh, Frontline. Uh, so you started. You, so so you, the whole networks, relationships, uh, the the people side of the business yep. is what kind of you, you started gravitating towards that. That's what I thought I was going to be into. I thought okay. I go on an interview and then I'll I'll be taking guys to lunch and selling products. Yep. But you know my way in was through this engineering side. And uh, and anyway, get, get, little did I know getting to those jobs where you take guys out to lunch and you you know you consult with them about their product lines. Was way down the line. Right. Those guys earned those jobs. Okay. Hard. Okay. Uh, but, but kind of a funny story how I got out of the whole hive of engineers was uh, I'm on this floor. It's nothing but engineering and, and product management uh, or project management. And uh, there's one guy named Tim McGarity whose uh, office is all the way across the, the the sea of cubicles from me. And he's an ex marine, and he's he's kind of like a he's just a really good leader. He likes to talk to everybody. He likes to help promote people. Okay. Just, just a great guy. Yeah. Just an absolute great guy. And every time I talk to Tim McGarity, I get a little bit more exposure. Like he would figure out more about me, ask some questions, invite me to you know have a coffee with him or, or whatever. So it kind of took me under his wing in terms of just sort of helping me. Kind of like a mentorship role. Yeah, kind of a mentorship, but like making sure I don't burn out. Right. Like, you know, hey, you're doing good things in this. Just keep going. And uh, so I started uh, rerouting my printer to print all the materials that I had to print off. Right next to Tim McGarry's office. Okay. So I'm on the other side of the, I mean, a sea of uh, cubicles. And I, I reroute my printer to LG46, which is right by Tim McGarry's office. Pretty smart move. So I kept printing because I had to print a lot because I was learning everything. And you know, I'd make mistakes constantly. So my, I, I probably used, I don't know how many printer cartridges in my time there in projects, but it was a lot. I figured if I'm going to be up out of my tiny little cubicle where nobody sees me, I might as well be standing up next to a guy who could potentially see me potentially see right. me i think he likes me and, and and at that time he had a leadership position too so long story short over thousands of documents printed and you know about a year on the floor you know tim and i would end up at the printer at the same time or he'd see me in the printer and invite me into his office and you know we just started a relationship and uh and tim mcgarity was a great accelerator for people at that time who were sort of diamonds in the rough you know he'd He'd find these particular personalities that were in these different groups and say, you know, I, he was so well networked within the company that he could say, hey, look, I think Brandon would be great at this. He's doing this right now, but over here in this group, he might do better. So he would look at the personality versus the skill set, which is, yeah, I, I think that's, that's uh, it seems like such a logical thing to do. You know what I mean? You want to get the right people versus the right skill set, I'd yeah. imagine. But yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's great. Yeah. And he was in, in his Marine leadership, you know, he wanted to mentor people. And, uh, you know, after, like I said, after thousands of documents and about a year of, you know, standing in front of his office, uh, you know, we got to having a discussion that there was another guy from corporate that was headhunting for these, these, uh, corporate account roles where you take care of some of these bigger customers yeah. and you get into exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in front of customers, figure out their pain, solution, pain, come up with solutions, value add, all that okay. all the corporate right. jargon. And, uh, you know, he asked me if I would be interested in something like that. And long story short, Tim got me out of that sea of engineers and uh, some very smart people into a more commercial role at, uh, at corporate sales. So what do you think about that? I loved it. Absolutely really, loved just it. right the first day. First day, it was like this is what I wanted. I, I you're, you're in your stride. You feel good. You're you're in your flow. First day, I, you know, I had a boss named Denny Adelong, and uh, he was a big hunter. Uh, you know, so all, the, all all of a sudden, I'm talking to guys that I have a lot of you know commonality with. I, right. I, I like to shoot guns. I like to hunt. Yeah. You know, I like to you know I, I like to talk to people. A lot of my group at the time at the project side was so busy with their spreadsheets and headphones on. You know, I was kind of isolated. So I get in this very uh, people person, A-type personality group with this guy that's a great leader. And uh, yeah, so Denny Adelong basically took me from this engineering group and put me in front of, you know, Key Energy Services, Dick Alario, uh, a lot of great guys. That okay. A lot of business with NOV at the time. And then I got to really figure out what I what I wanted to do. And that's being in front of customers and understanding how to how to take care of the problems. Okay. All right. So, so how long were you in that role before you moved up to your next role? Uh, a couple of years. So, so the, uh, it was a, it's a global account division that I was in. And what Danny did with me is he, he really saw that I had a passion for uh, really figuring out how to make sure that these solutions worked internally and externally. And he said, the best way to do that is to assign you specifically to a customer. So I became what you call an on-site solutions director 
which they put me inside the customer's office. So yeah, could, uh, in-house. Uh, in-house. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm their guy to make sure that the revenue works well, but I'm also there to snipe and cut all the other vendors you know, out of the... Out of That's kind of weird, too, because it's like whenever you are put in-house, I mean that culture might not fit with the, you know, you, oh, yeah. you might not be used to the culture that if you're in house, but you gotta, you gotta, if you're in, you gotta play that game though. Again, being the guy who moved around every three years, you know, I, I was, was fine throwing, for you throwing me in downtown. Okay. The key energy. And, uh, you know, at the time we were spending X amount of dollars and my goal was to pump that up to, you know, three times. Right. And, uh, so I got into the key energy services sort of culture and understood what they wanted to do. And I was good at it, and uh, I, I was I was able to really increase their revenue level with NOV. Okay. <clears throat> and by doing so, my boss Danny says, "Okay, if you could do that, teach others to do this." You know, this is this is they had an on-site solutions director role at the time, but you know they they wanted to do it in a more effective way. Uh, so I became an off-site solutions director, which meant I take care of the customer. wasn't in their office, but I was helping guys that were kind of peripheral to my role do better with their okay. customers inside their offices. So that was kind of my first test of leadership. Can I can I can I help others do what I was doing? So it's more of a trainer, kind of a kind of a trainer role. Yeah, kind of yeah. A trainer role okay. And, you know, more of like a best practices. What what am I doing versus what other works. people? Yeah. And what works or what's worked for me? Uh, and 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 that was sort of a, a micromanagement course and you know how do you how do you how do you teach others? Did you like did you did you uh, how, how was teaching for you? Was it did you fall into? It? I mean, it would, or did you enjoy it? I loved it. I okay. loved, so I loved helping people. Okay. I, I love sharing best practices. You know, I, I actually gained a lot of uh, information from the people that I would be helping as well. So uh, it was a great two-way street. I would learn a lot. They learned something, hopefully. And uh, and it was uh, it gave me the ability to look at bigger problems, more accounts. Uh, so they kept adding more and more accounts to my, okay. my account list. All right. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I, got, I got fairly proficient at that. Um, stay in that role for a while. And then, you know, I had the dream shot of being on a team that got promoted into a vice president role. Um, my whole group did because we were under, okay. under Denny and, uh, and it was, uh, and then I got to really do what I wanted to. And that's, which, which is, that's finding unique technologies that NOV had. And then basically looking in the back cave and finding what, what's the, what's the thing that's been on the rack that we haven't pulled out yet. That, that we haven't be, focused on, that we haven't even spoke about. We've, we've been too busy. We've been gobbling up company after company after company. Uh, you know, I, I explained it kind of out there. It's like storage wars where, you know, NOV acquisitions was like, you open the storage uh, center and you see baseball cards. You want those baseball cards. So NOV buys the, Buy whole, the, whole, thing. the whole thing. But within those baseball cards, there's you know, World War II coins and all these other things. Yeah. And that was kind of like NOV for a while. We, we had things that were... Uh, just just uh, breakthrough technologies that we didn't really even know that we had. Uh, okay. So I, I really got into uncovering what do we get from these acquisitions? What's what's in the back cave that I could bring out? What kind of engineering team can I put together? And how can I get this into the customer's office to get adoption? And uh, that was a blast. I mean, that sounds pretty interesting because I mean, not only not only are you uh, uh, kind of doing, fulfilling your role, get in front of customers, but you're also looking at this new, not, whether it's new technology or just technology that's not in the forefront of NOV's yeah. mind, you're kind of trying to trying to piecemeal together something that may work for the customer. That's kind of like a detective work a little bit. I like that. Well, it's fun because, you know, we, we'd have these massive problems and you didn't have to be a genius to understand the problems. Uh, for one, let's just say key energy services at the time had tons of saltwater disposal wells all right. and they'd bring in all these trucks and they'd, they'd dispose of their saltwater at these massive, you know, injection wells. But they'd be leaving, you know, two or three percent of oil in that produced water, and the disposal guys would just kind of skim that oil off the top, and they'd make money off of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and Key had a bunch of disposal wells, and you know, all, while the skim was pretty proficient, it would be better if they were able to take even more of that oil out of the water from, you know, a, from a from from a much smaller standpoint. So we had this this solution called a water wolf, and this water wolf would, you know, connect to a great name, by the way. Yeah, the guy. The guy's name is Mark Wolf. He's an engineer, and he came up with this thing, and, and uh, that we, we called it the Water Wolf. Oh, yeah. And uh, only only because the guy was named Wolf, but it was a uh, he's a fantastic engineer, and he uh, he came up with this just breakthrough solution, and um, it's it's still doing great things at NOV. So you're there, you're enjoying this, you're yeah. you're, you're solving problems with this new technology and uh, your promotion now, so everything's pretty good. So. You're not there anymore. Nope, not there anymore. So it, it, it's, it's kind of hysterical. I, I, I got my chops sort of wet with the water wolf and then these other technologies like yeah. that, which really showed how much value can be, uh, can, can be uh, how much value is left on the table 
that we're not, if we're not proficiently processing both waste and water. I saw what happened when you pull oil out of water with this water wolf and how much that can impact overall revenue. Uh, and then the same thing with, uh, you know, with waste, solids control, especially when you're on a, the drilling shakers as they're processing the drilling fluid from the, uh, uh, the drill cuttings, you know, there's a lot of waste that goes in that right. process. And by being in the water wolf circle where I'm out there promoting new technologies, I'm getting a vision of the entire market. I'm seeing, you know, what are the new game changing technologies, both, you know, externally and internally. And one of those game changing technologies was a company called Cubility. Okay. And they had a very unique way of separating solids uh, from the drilling fluid. It was, it was this gigantic red vacuum cleaner, basically. Was that, this a separate company or was this a company that ended up being, uh, this is, was this Storage Wars? It was like in the air in the corner? No, this is something that I saw in the market okay. that was out there. That was actually a, a threat or possibly, you know, an acquisition target for NOV at the time. All right. And, uh, you know, long story short, I got introduced to these guys and, uh, you know, with the background of the water wolf and kind of things I'd done there, uh, I went over to Cubility, left, left a nice, nice gig at NOV, uh, you know. One of the most well-known, you know, companies out there in the oil industry. Took, right. Took a major risk. I, you know, I, I used to joke that people would have my head examined for making that decision. And how, how old was your, uh, was your son then? He was, uh, let's see, he was three or four. Okay. So, All right. So I was maybe getting less sleep, and that's why I was more irrational. But uh, no, no, I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. So. But but what I saw was I saw I saw that there's so much potential with things like the water wolf, and then Cubility had this solids control system that, you know, I saw the writing on the wall. It was a different different way to do everything, and uh, so I decided to leave this 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 uh, this great role and uh, go take a chance to do something else. And uh, long story short, learned a lot about solids control. Uh, got this very Norwegian offshore centric, only done on stat oil rigs uh, into the U.S. land market, okay. uh, both U.S. and Canada. Uh, had some great distributors now that were, you know, are, are rocking stuff all over. How was that going from such a, a well-established company like, you know, NOV, and you got the support team, you got whatever, accounting, you got da, 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 mm -hmm. to go into kind of a, a smaller company and, and you, it's it's not as much of a support system as you had previously. Well, I'm assuming. Oh, it was it was less support for sure. But uh, you know the great thing about uh, you know I had never worked for a Norwegian company before yeah. either, and uh, you know just just great people in general, and and super nice and super organized. So it wasn't it, it wasn't jumping off the cliff to the degree where you know there was no back end. Right. They had it. They had a. They had structure. They had they had systems and processes. Uh, they just needed the revenue pull through, and they needed to get this product. You know, off the off the North Sea side and into okay. You know where the where the action was after fifteen was the the shell revolution. Right. U.S. land was the play. Almost nothing was happening offshore. So that's what that their whole focus was. Can you please try to push this into U.S. land and then other geographies? Which uh, which over the course of three years we figured out how to get this red vacuum cleaner to add enough value on land to where it was a it was a no brainer. Okay. People said okay. I mean. In the best widget wins environment, where it no longer matters if you know the NOV guy took you out to lunch five thousand times, that's the solids control system you're going to go with. Uh, the post fifteen environment was how much money can you save me? And uh, it became real price, low cost focus, or how much money can you absolutely. save? Yeah, absolutely. Fifteen sixteen. Fifteen sixteen became made the best widget win, and then also uh, we start to see these these startings of how much environmental. Uh, impact is having on my drilling solution. Okay. So we're starting to see regulation, not to not to a large degree, but there's now a value in promoting. Uh, this is the advent of there's a lot of clean tech talk at this point, 15, 16. Uh, and now part of the narrative, at least within corporate, was is your drilling solution uh, valuable? Does it do things well? And now how is it on the environment and how is it on the people that work for or work around it? Right. And this Cubility solution has a vacuum uh, separation mechanism. So all those drilling fumes that come up with with the bit and gets processed mm -hmm. through, it's all getting sucked through the machine. Not only that, it's getting it's separating the fluid at such a high rate that you're not using more drilling fluid. So all of a sudden, your mud bill is a million dollars less of well or whatever it was. But And then the frontline workers that are standing on top of these sh shell shakers all day long, they're getting full ventilation, so all that, all those fumes are being pulled down and uh, and away from the, the human element. Yeah. Okay. So, so then I thought, hey, it feels good to sell a solution that not only is adding 
you know, massive value to the customer, but it's also, you know, impacting the environment. It's also uh, reducing uh, yeah, the customer value, the, the invoices, yeah. and also protecting the people too. Protecting the people. And when I go and talk to guys that, you know, were working on shell shakers most of their lives, and then they switched over to, you know, the, the, the community solution, it was like I was like the greatest guy in the world for having that there. And they, they go through how loud everything was and how you're breathing these yeah, yeah. stuff in yeah. all the time. And, yeah. you know, their life was like, you know, they might they might have been sitting there on the Corona beach, you know, after that, that, that cubility yeah. was got in there. So it's, uh, I really liked, enjoy, I really enjoyed seeing the impact of good technology and what that could do all the way around, you know, both from the vendor side, operator side and the frontline. Okay. Master. All right. Cool. I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. That's really cool. And, uh, and I, and I, I really enjoyed that. Program. All right. Yeah. So you're doing that for about three years. You, you introduced this this new technology into the U.S. land, the shale in, oh, the yeah. shale play. So got 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 that done, and uh, uh, found two great distributors, both in Canada and the Lower 48, that had long term deals with uh, Cubility for for uh, for land. And uh, around that time, um, a very interesting opportunity in Silicon Valley popped up. Again, I'm in these conferences, you know, Waterwolf put me in these, these, these small groups of not just oil and gas technologies, but disruptive. And I hate to use that word. because Use it. I, just, you, you know, we're, we're all about cliches these days. Just yes. use it. Disruptive Very technology. Things are really disruptive, but, you know, interesting or different or, or off, uh, off the beaten path. And, and some of these conferences where I'm pre, you know, presenting, you know, the Cubility solution and some of these clean tech conferences, I'm, I'm usually grouped in with guys that are using alternative fuel solutions. Okay. And one of these alternative fuel solutions was the Silicon Valley startup uh, called Artica, and they had figured out a way to uh, make hydrogen uh, maintain in a solid form, a solid form that wouldn't blow up, that you could put into a, a case, and then uh, produce energy for, you know, 50 times longer than a lithium ion. Interesting. All right. So I met this guy, uh, Chris Lichter, at a conference, and we kept up with the technologies over the years. and. He had a breakthrough with the U.S. military. Uh, they wanted to test this stuff out. They wanted to produce this stuff at scale. So I figured, you know, I'd, I'd done the drilling thing with Norway. And uh, at that time, Silicon Valley Tech and the alternative fuel sources were, were, were a lot. There, there are tons of them. Everybody's competing for who's going to be the next right. uh, alternative fuel. Right. And I thought that this technology was just amazing. So um, long story short, ended up in San Francisco going back and forth, uh, figuring out how do we... One, get this this uh, this hydrogen technology into not just the military market, but does it have crossover abilities? Okay. Can Caterpillar use this stuff? Can they run backhoes off of this, All right. this, this energy source? Uh, lots of challenges making this stuff at scale. It's, it's very volatile in laboratory form. But once you get this stuff made, it's, it's, it's like magic. So um, got into alternative fuels there, learned a lot. Really kind of got my butt kicked because of the science was just extreme. I mean, it's extreme to make this stuff at scale. Uh, learned a lot about that. That allowed me to basically see how multi-fuel our future really is. You know, my whole my whole life I'd spent or my whole career I'd spent on the hydrocarbon side. And you hear the narrative of, you know, what is alternative energy and is that going to have a significant role within, you know, the, uh, our future. Right. And oil and gas guys usually, you know, uh, are pretty receptive to it, quite quite honestly. They, we have this horrible, horrible stigma that we're anti-renewables or anti, you know, saving the environment when that's kind of what we've been focused on for the past 20, 25 years. Not only is it, it so, so safety focused, safety, safety is God. massive in the, in the oil and gas industry. And they're also not avert to, to other ways to, to skin the cat. No, I've never met one person that's anti-renewables. They're, they're not, but they're realists, though. I yes. Think, I, think, I think they're saying, okay, you know how much wind generation you're going to need to power a third world nation that uses diesel right now? <laughs> yeah, no, that, but that's the thing, though. It's, 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 it's they're, they're realists. You're right. I mean, but they're not like, anti. It's like, look, the technology's not here yet. But until then, let's continue to provide a, a, a cheap economic source of fuel. Yeah. For these people, yeah. And then the thought process, too, on that, it would be that if you go into some of these, let's, like, let's just say California, hydrogen, alternative fuel, okay. super green, you go into that world and you think as an oil and gas guy, these guys are going to be anti-oil. Oh, absolutely. Big, you know, just they hate everybody. But not the case. Again, I'm, I'm in this this uh, this company with a lot of Stanford lab guys that have come up with this, this alternative. And turns out they're realists, too. They see the future as, you know, even if we could produce this hydrogen element at scale, I mean, the demand for energy is going to be so massive in the future that we need everything. Yeah. We're a multi-fuel. So I think 
I think you have the polar opposites on either side, just like we do with politics or anything else, that have these narratives that they say, oil and gas is anti, you know, sustainable and and you know, sustainability and green size anti oil and gas. I love I love when other people write our industry's narratives. Yeah. I love that. That's my favorite thing in the world. And it's really not true. And and I know it's true in some cases, and, and I have met some people on both sides of the coin that are that, are that way, but um, but I did get to see that, you know, from just a hydrogen standpoint, if we were looking to power even a quarter of the energy demands, that the, the massive hurdles that are in front of hydrogen, wind, solar. We're just not there yet. We're not there yet. Right. We, we need everything. Right. You're not Again, I'll use my, my Africa or Congo example. You're not going to get electric electrification in a third world market. It's just too expensive. I mean, diesel is, is cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, they'll have it, maybe. But, you know, in the near term, there's... there's We're not there. We're not there. We need right. everything we right. can possibly get. And we probably need things that we haven't even thought about yet. Yeah. So it's, that's uh, a good way to think. I mean, that's the technology side of, uh, of your uh, upbringing. That's, that's a good right. point. That's right. There's stuff that, out, that are out there that are bridge the gap. I, I think, you know, uh, remember Back to the Future. When, when <laughs> I just talked about a DeLorean yesterday for about 45 minutes. <laughs> yes, I know Back to the Future. Well, you remember when Doc, I think it was like I don't know, three or four. I forgot how many of those movies they made, but. You know, in the beginning, it was plutonium. The right. lead ran off plutonium. Had to get it hard to get. That was the beginning of Back to the Future 2 when he dropped like the banana peel and all that stuff. That, yes, that was Back to the Future 2. That's 2. Okay, so that's that's our future. You know, he, he's got plutonium. That's good, but he could also make it run off of a beer can and, you know, banana peel. Banana, but yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think our future is a lot like that. I think we're going to have to use. Well, where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> I think that. So. It applies, but it still it still needs plutonium to a certain degree. So how did you get how did you get doing this? Silicon Valley, so you're only getting, so hospitality. Right. Only guess Silicon Valley. So how are you now at uh, Lamore? Yeah, so I got even one more stop before between then. So, oh, okay. So I uh, so I did the, the Silicon Valley thing for about a year, and it just it just wasn't for that position in terms of scaling this technology. It wasn't going to happen within the, the the near term. You know, it was uh, too many challenges, too many hurdles. Um, not to say that it won't someday. Yeah. But around the same time too, I'm getting mm-hmm. exposure to. Uh, Again, it's all about the circles you're running. Uh, these venture capital tech conferences where they would promote various solutions that were both energy sensitive or value adding for the environment. And there's a solution called the Harbo Boom, <clears throat> which I would like to relate to as, you know, if you go into any office in the world, you have an AED unit on the wall for defibrillator. If you have a heart attack, oh, yeah, okay, all right, I've seen those. Right down the street, yep. you know, right there. You put them on your chest. Anybody can use them with minimal training. Right next to the soda machine, right, <laughs> right, right next to the thing that may have caused. Yeah, right next to the snack machine full of uh, and the sodas full of high fructose corn. Pork so, rinds, yeah, Coke, AED. defibrillator. Yeah. yeah, so you get all the bases covered. So, so that defibrillator unit is is kind of like the example I use like to use for the Harbo unit. Right now, when you have an oil spill, either domestically, offshore, wherever, you usually have to make three or four phone calls and get somebody who's a specialist to come out and respond to that spill. And that lag time could be anywhere from 24 to, you know, two weeks, 24 hours. Which weeks. is not what you want when you have a spill. Not what you want when you have a spill. So what these guys in Israel came up with is this boom in a box. It's a, it's a box that weighs about 45 pounds. You open it up, you pull this thing out, it hits the water, foam absorbs, and you can surround an oil spill, you know, with with anybody, okay. anybody, basically. So you have people at uh, at these, you know, petro refineries have a spill. They're not trained on the equipment. They take out this this the stop loss solution. They can isolate. They it. can isolate. It. Right. And anybody can do it. And I said, well, that's really cool. Yeah. You know, that's uh, thinking thinking. You know, I just came from as high tech as possible, which is hydrogen, to what would be considered lower tech. But again, at, at that time, I'm looking for things that haven't been done yet. You know, there's 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 new ways to do things, and nobody's ever thought about how to contain an oil spill. You like that side. You like you like bringing this new new products, new services, different ways to view things. You don't like selling the standard stuff that's in the toolbox. You like kind of bringing new things to market or introducing new technologies. That's right. I, I like to, I like to that's come into something you. that 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 you haven't heard about before, or maybe you haven't thought of. And I also like it when you tell me that'll never work here. You know, yeah. I've heard that so many times in my career that. This thing will never work. And that's not going to You just keep on going. I'll just keep going. Okay. That's, All right. I, I love it when you tell me. Okay. Sure. And uh, so, so worked for Harbo for a while, uh, which brought me into Lamore. This is where I'm working for now. Lamore is the leader of oil spill response technology. They are the NOV of the... the from oil from the headquarters in Finland. He- headquarters in Finland. Okay. Yep. Um, they've got oil spill response. I mean, if there's an oil spill around the world... There is a little more piece of kit on that oil spill, you know, 100%. They're they're massive in terms of oil spill. So there's a lot of different offices, I guess, 
a lot of global partners, you know, okay. like 56 countries. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're, so what I liked about going into Lemoore is, you know, NOV is corporate America, 60,000 people when I was there. Yep. And I get into these no more than 30 people companies. And I do that for a few years. And then I go to Lemoore. They've been did around. Did they reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? Or yeah. do you see their technology? And you're like, I want to be part of this team. So I'm promoting this hardware solution. Okay. And, you know, they are the 300 pound gorilla in the industry. So they see this Harbo solution. They've got all the conventional kit and they like, they like the Harbo solution. Uh, they like how I'm selling it or at least trying to compete with them. To sell. Okay. And, uh, so they're the Yankees pretty much. They're the Yankees, yeah. but they're also, you know, again, all Scandinavian people, or at least the ones I've had exposure to, uh, these Norwegians was Cubility. Uh, the Finns are, are, uh, Lemoore are just great people. I've, I've really enjoyed right. just, just their culture is awesome. And, uh, you know, long story short, I hit it off with their CEO and, uh, they were getting into things, not only oil spill response related, but they had just tackled, you know, a major initiative with waste and water, two things I have a lot of experience in. So, yeah. so I knew a lot about drill cuttings and, and disposal and, and what, what happens with that process with my experience with Cubility. Knew a lot about water, uh, you know, with, with the, uh, with the NOV side. Right. And then obviously I just spent some time with the oil spill response with the Harbo thing. So you get the, uh, you get the, 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 the tripod. So the Trinity of those. Trinity, uh, Trinity, Trinity, better word, yeah. better word than tripod. Tripod's a good word. <laughs> so, okay. So you got every, you got, yeah. you got the background and you're talking to C. So this is the competitor, major competitor. Major competitor. And so you just kind of bump into the CEO or what? Bump, yeah, yeah. Literally bumped into him at the biggest trade show uh, in, in Lafayette, Louisiana. Okay, uh, cool. New Orleans, uh, the spill conference. There's a massive spill conference every year in New Orleans. And my booth, you know, I'm out there once again. Widget man selling the product, talking to customers about you know, right. this Harbo solution versus these very slow and archaic, you know, long-term solutions that the industry is selling. And uh, just got talking to the CEO, uh, a guy named Mika, and uh, just just really hit it off. And we uh, we kept in touch. Uh, he was very much for the Harbo solution. He thought it was needed within the marketplace, whether it was them that did it or or us at the time. All right. And uh, and long story short, I, I went over. I, I got offered a role with, with them, and um, we've actually, as of recently, we've bought the licensing for the Harbo solution. So I've taken the product that I help build and put into into motion. Now we've taken it back into in, back in the toolbox. Back into the toolbox and the more. Well, that's pretty. I mean, that's pretty exciting. So be, so global business development, VP of global business yeah. development. Mm-hmm. So how how are you finding? I guess. I guess I'm, I'm assuming that during a global, a VP of global business development, you, it requires some travel, it requires some uh, dealings with international customers, yeah. various customers. How is that right now? I guess since March. It's 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 it's. So all, you started you started over at Lemoore when? Uh, last March. Last okay, so, so, be, I, so before I, shit hit the fan. Right as it was hitting. Oh the okay. Right, so right. so March is really when I think I think COVID started to sort of see. Yeah. And we, yeah. We started thinking that this thing from China might be a real deal. Uh, but yeah, so I, I started this, 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 what would be a highly global job, you know, on the road, just like it was. Requiring a lot of day. travel on the side. A lot of traveling. Then all of a sudden I'm doing everything like, like what we're doing now from yeah. Zoom. And, uh, you know, it, it, it taught us at Lamore, at least it taught us, you know, how much fat we could cut off in our processes. Yeah. What, what is working effectively? Cause you can only stay on a Zoom call for so long. And then, you know, what I would hold on a second, say that again, so people can understand that you can only stay on a Zoom call for so long. You don't have to continue it for 15 minutes after you're done. You can just get off and you can cut the social stuff. That's it. Once you log on, we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to talk about it. We don't. We don't. You and I, we, we could catch up because yeah, this is a social thing. But when you know the people, let's just, just write it. Yes, it. Just, I agree. Let's, just, let's not talk about it. Tell them about the flood right now. Okay. So so we've gotten good at that a little more. And plus, the, I would say about the, the people in Finland, uh, they, they don't have a lot of. Uh, they have less BS in, yeah. in their whole culture life. Super honest, directly to the point, which which has been just a joy. That's a breath of fresh air. Uh, but but in terms of operations uh, in the global scale, uh, and we were talking about this before, as commodity prices in the oil and gas market especially dropped, storage increases dramatically. You know, we've got buildup of for a while there when oil was negative, yeah. we had ships that didn't have docks. Yeah, you know these tankers were sitting offshore, you know, in lines, and uh, you know you'd go pick up oil from. Texas for, you know, negative the price. Anyway, we went through a very sm- interesting period of commodity prices. Uh, but that, what that all means is a massive buildup of storage. Okay. And so at Lemoore, we have two major challenges during COVID. We've got this massive buildup of storage, which inevitably equals some sort of spill. So we saw the Mauritius oil spill in East Africa. We saw a big one in Russia. There's a massive one in South America. 
every other day a spill is right. in you know, your news feed, and that, that's that's our business. So we're having to figure out how do we organize local content, people that are close to the spill, uh, with travel regulations where we could send teams, you know, and how do we how do yeah. we organize these quick response uh, solutions, which a lot we have locally, and uh, and how do we coordinate that without being you know boots on the ground sometimes. So uh, you know, Lamore did a great job of understanding where the strengths were and how to respond to some of these massive spills that even in the best of climates would have been uh, so very difficult. Lamore being the three hundred pound grill in the room, one of the well, I guess one of the the, the major the V uh, spill response. Um, uh, uh, company, uh, yeah, in, in company, whatever you want to call sure. it. So they did. So with the company that size, I mean, they were able to pivot pretty quickly, and I guess uh, address this because I was assuming it's just kind of like well control. I would assume like the spills are kind of like well control. Not like understand not this, but at the same time, the impact is there, and you need boots on the ground. You need people looking at this. You need people assessing what's happening and how to respond. So I guess for them to pivot so quickly and to I guess. Uh, be in a situation to handle these type of uh, uh, spills or these spills. I mean, that's that's that. How how were they able to pivot so quickly? They had an amazing network of so Lemoore is global. They've got a presence in almost every major country. Okay. So they, they they do have some infrastructure almost everywhere. Okay. And what they're able to do in a lot of these situations where we had some super remote jobs that were hard to do is they're able to couple together a lot of their other distributors vendors. Uh, people that touch Lamore maybe to a less significant degree, okay. you know, they carry a couple of more products, and consolidate a lot of these these vendors and operators together and uh, and, and respond as sort of a, a collective. So there's an incentive to take those Lamore products that were maybe unrelated and then put them together with the local responders that were okay. Close. All right. So it was kind of a logistics job for for the guys in, in Finland. Um, again, these guys are great under pressure. They they love a good challenge. And they were able to find the right responders at the right time with the right products, overcome the shipping logistics hurdles, and uh, and be on these sites quickly. Well, how's that been for you uh, personally? I mean, you're, you're starting this new company, uh, you're, you're VP of Global Sales, uh, you, you're ready to hit the ground running. You're starting in March. You like it in front of people. You like interacting. And uh, uh, I mean, you traveled. I mean, you moved every three years. So I mean, how is it now? Suddenly, boom! You hit this uh, place where you can't travel. Travel's restricted. New role, yeah. like how how was that for you? I guess uh, adapting and adjusting. It was it was absolutely it, it, it was so disoriented at first because you know I was the guy on the plane every yeah. few months, if not every week. Uh, and when it first stopped, I I, I had to kind of take a take take account to what how am I going to do my job from this perspective? Right. How am I going to grow revenue? How am I going to add value? What are we going to do to to make sure that Lamore gets value out of me for sure? Right. Because my impact is usually right in front of somebody or on the on the site or in front of the customer. Now, you take away that customer once removed maybe from the Zoom, and then it's a completely different world. So what I did personally to help pivot for that loss of personal touch was we really focused on the digital marketing side. Okay. So we, we, we overhauled, uh, we did a lot of SEO on our website. We overhauled everything we did in terms of how we collected leads online. Everybody's on their computers now. Oh yeah. So instead of being focused on you know, the direct line relationship with the salespeople and how we did that, I started really focusing on how do we run our digital side and how do we collect leads and how do we get on somebody's third page of Google and how do we chase them after they've been on our website. So what, what did you learn through all this process? Obviously, so the, the focus is on uh, online presence, right? Whether it's content or whether it's generating. So how did you, um, I guess, uh, was it trial and error? Was it uh, outsourced or what? Yeah, so I, 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 I worked with the same, so I kind of had the same same uh, floor, uh, game plan when I go into these new organizations. Usually in Startup City, they've done nothing on the digital market. Okay. They've just got a website to make sure that they're legit. They're there. But they, they, they have a, a thought that the t if they build the technology, the customers will come. Right. You know, nobody does business on online for the most part, which I found kind of counterintuitive because I'm of the generation where we're, we're the Amazon generation. Yeah. You know, everything comes to our front door. We look everything up. If I want to know who you are, I'm going to look you up on LinkedIn and, and Facebook. A little background check. Yeah, who, yeah. Know, it's it's just sort of a, it's sort of the process that I think is is, is most overlooked in startups. So there's no blind dates anymore. <laughs> there's no blind anything. Anymore. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, I've done this. This is my 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 playbook when I go into startups would be to overhaul the digital side. And Lamore had been around for you know, 25 years. And they weren't as interested at, on the digital side prior to the, the slowdown. They right. were 
their brand recognition we got massive. a great we got a great service we got a great name we got a great product people know us and they'll just call we're us everywhere you can't buy around us right. you know we're, we're, we're pretty much here right but how do we optimize that especially with new products uh more or less now that we're in waste and water which which that's a super competitive you know everybody's in waste oh and yeah water now. oh yeah and how are we going to compete for attention within those spaces and and what are we going to do differently in waste and water that not everybody's doing so digital side became extremely important and then overhauling the value propositions in terms of what is it that we do that somebody else can't do in a different region especially for waste and water has been sort of uh, the, the job of the entire sales team. So you, the, the, the presence is there, um, your footprints all over the globe. Uh, so as far as generating content, you really don't have to introduce the company. You know, I mean, people know the company, people know what y'all do. Da, da. Yeah. So I guess um, you, you kind of answered this before, but what was your, I guess, focus when it comes to, okay, yeah. people know who we are, they know what we do. Da, da. I'm going to focus on this message to the to the to the customers because you it's an established company. Sure. So what message uh, what messages were you thinking of trying to go go down and communicate? The, the, ma the major messages were that we, we we not only are the oil spill responders, we're the guys that are going to be able to take that oily water and produce it. You know, take the oil out of it. We're yeah. also going to be those guys that can set up a solids control facility in South America, where you know the Schlumbergers and the bigger guys. Maybe the economics don't work for the bigger companies to go, but we can do that because okay. we're a smaller company and we've got different incentives. So it was more or less broadening the message of what 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 do we do? Yes, we're known for this, but we really do these things right. too. And uh, and understanding and converting customers because you know you know this with sales, uh, a lot of times you're cannibalizing your own foot because you're not asking the questions to the customers of. What else do you need? Yeah, you know, a lot of times there's you put your blinders on. You say, okay, I only sell uh, this this bottle of water, and that's you're done. Okay, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. What else do you need? And more than likely, they're taking that service up the road where you're like, oh, but by the way, we do this too. You just never asked. So we're, so once I guess uh, restrictions kind of get picked up and uh, things go back to whatever. I'm not even whatever. You know what I mean? Um, whatever. I, I'm so sick of that. So <laughs> once kind of thing, once the environment changes a little bit, where where you can get out there, you can travel. I guess is the is the digital side, the marketing side of things, still going to be a um, a focus, or is is it going to be getting out there, and getting in front of people? I mean, what's 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 going to be in your uh, in your wheelhouse? It'll be both. Now, now now that we've got the digital side really humming, I yeah. think we've, we've, we've done this now for a hundred. 20 day we have what you call plan for the best initiatives with them or more mm -hmm. it's not planned for the worst it's planned for the best and that's how we introduce new concepts so our digital overhaul was a plan for the best initiative and we took 120 days to see how much can we pump our statistics up on our website how much can we pump up our lead generation what can we do in 120 days of pure focus with the right assets on the digital side so once you get that ball rolling digitally then it keeps rolling as long as you keep you know Putting into the uh, yes, yeah, so it, it still needs effort and energy. Yeah, it still needs effort, but but it, it's a it's a it's a compounding interest okay. sort of deal. So now that we've got that off and running, it, it'll obviously be going into markets, capturing more customers, and then and then again, you know, at waste and water is our is our main focus going forward. We have a very good um, presence within oil spill response. We'd like to be in more waste and water markets, especially lower forty eight. Um, if we could get a piece of this business here, it'd be fantastic. Uh, but more or less, we focus on markets that are usually underserved. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of places in South America right now, for instance, that okay. uh, people are drilling and processing waste that are smaller in cap. Uh, you know, again, uh, Schlumberger, uh, some of these bigger service companies probably aren't going to uh, sunk costs. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. There's nothing else there except for this one thing. Right. So we're finding those kind of uh, positions around the world and. Uh, Obviously, after we couple together, you know, a portfolio of these positions, then we'll we'll look into uh, competing in more of the mainstream markets. Well, one thing uh, that we've been discussing here on the on the, on the podcast is uh, being an industry advocate and discussing our you know our, our the good we do, um, not just for the world but for our communities and all that stuff. I mean, how much is I guess storytelling? Um, uh, is that something that that you, you thought about? Because it's global leader and in oil spill response and environmental solutions, including waste major water. So it seems like it's, it's. I mean, you're stopping spills, you're treating water, yeah. da, 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 da. I mean, is there, um, besides, you know, this is our core business is what we do, is there a, a kind of a, a side or, or a, a storytelling aspect of it that uh, 
that the y'all's company does. And so this is kind of how we help or uh, when, when things go bad, we, we, we we're there to help the community. I mean, is it something that hundred percent, our, our motto is let's clean the world okay. uh, together. Let's clean the world. And, and, and without context, that kind of seems like a very granola green thing, but mm-hmm. you know, we say, let's clean the world. Let's, you know, we have a one Lamore standpoint where all of our partners, everybody that kind of couples together, we're, we're one team. Yeah. You know, we don't like division much within our distributors, our partners. And our goal is to clean the world. We're also doing some crazy stuff like recycling uh, river plastic waste. You know, okay. That's another frontier where you see a lot of these guys going to the, the landmass that's the size of Texas and, you know, offshore taking a lot of that yeah. plastic out. Yeah. But it gets there by going through rivers. First of all, some of these third world nations have massive amounts of plastic in the river going out into the ocean. Right. And now we're starting to take, uh, through some partnerships, we're starting to take plastics out of these massive rivers that end up to be these land masses. I think that would be such a cool story to tell or, or put more focus on on stuff like that. You know, like the, the stuff we are doing proactively for the environment. I, I just think that us as, us as an industry, we need to be doing that more, you know, and, uh, and, it's, and speaking to that. Absolutely. And and I think I think there's synergies there, too. I mean, uh, one of the things that the plastic market, let's just say the plastic recovery market, yep. taking all these bottles out of rivers, you know, what do we do with that plastic? Well, if there's an incentive to buy these products, let's just say something within drilling, there's a lot of frac products that could probably be, be there you go. plastic. That would be a, you know, a, a, you know, obviously a synergy. Yeah, right? that would be something that. I think it would be natural. So we're going to have a lot of resource, just like water. At one point, everybody just threw produce water away. Now produce water is gold because it's got oil on it. I think the same thing is going to happen with river water where you have all this plastic, all these hydrocarbon-based plastics that are coming down in these rivers. If you collect a bunch of that stuff, you've got a commodity. You can do something with it. And if you can figure out how to really transition that into the public space or even the private space, I think uh, I think that would be that would be the goal. Well, I'm, I'm, I think we're coming up on an hour right now. It's so probably have to wrap it up. But I, got, I just got a question for you. I mean, it seems like your background, your third generation oil field, travel here, this industry, that industry, like these different roles and all that stuff. But it seems like you're uh, you're not. I don't. Again, it's the first time I mean, but it seems like you're driven. Um, you know, whether it's not the title, not the not the paycheck, not this, but it seems like you're driven for like a solution based thinking outside of the box, new innovative ways uh, to help our and to help your customers. How do you constantly have that mindset of is because it, it seems like it's just it's not it's not it's it's a different mindset. So how do you how do you con- continuously have that mindset? First of all, it's a very ADD way to think. Okay. Okay. So, so be ADD. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 not you know I would I would wish my uh, my attention deficit on anybody, but I, I think I think what what my what what my 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 general capacity to understand what's needed in the marketplace has always kind of shown me what would be the next thing, and I like to be first to market with a lot of things, and I think that what drives me is understanding what are the challenges that are going are currently happening. Yeah. What, what are we currently seeing, and then. You know, is there is there a, a near term best solution that exists that could solve that problem? And if somebody, if I come by that information myself, which is very rarely, uh, usually somebody else tells me about that information, and then it starts to take in my head, and then I think. Hmm, so it's always problem. conversations. It's always uh, what's the problem? Is there a solution? And if not, what would be a solution? Type of conversations you have? Yeah, it's it's, it's what is the major like you know the NOV days. At least they taught you to really understand customer pain. Right. What is the pain? You find the pain, you find the solution. Happy customer. Okay. So more or less, you know, in, in these various circles that I've ran in, I've always asked the questions. You know, what what are the biggest challenges? What would be if you could change anything in, in the industry? What would what would that be? Uh, is there a silver bullet for your problem? But the thing is, though, once you get the information, you don't you don't say, oh, well, that's not there yet. Sorry. No. What else could we do? So you take that information, like it's not here yet. Is it? Can we find it? Can we piece it together? So I think that's, I, I think that extra step, I think is uh, is 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 crucial. I guess in your situation, when you're constantly trying to bring new technology, new innovative ways to handle a problem or introduce a problem introduce a service. You've got to be hungry for it. Yeah. For sure. And uh, and and I, and I do like. I have great satisfaction walking away, and, and when I see. Let's just say a cubility mud cube on the back of a a, a, a big truck going down I-10, uh, headed to the uh, Eagleford. You know, I, I see that big red uh, solids control solution, and then that thing was in Norway five years ago. Now it's on I-10. So you can see there, the, and I can see the results. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I can, I can see the the technology with the, the the soldier battery power units that are still 
you know, it's still in development, but eventually a soldier will be able to stay out in the field two weeks longer than he would prior. You know, his mission will probably right. be completed. Uh, and now, you know, we're stopping oil spills, you know, all the time with this hardware solution that would not be stopped before. It would have been a lot worse. A lot worse. We've had a, some case examples of some uh, some refineries that, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. There's just a, a security guard, a safety guy, and maybe one line worker, and they've got this major problem, and they just say, well, we could just call somebody else, but we'll grab this thing and out the corner. And, and then we'll call someone else. And we'll put it out there and we'll stop it. And then, you know, the economics on, on that one decision of having – I should say the, the defibrillator unit of oil spills next to them has been massive. Oh, I can imagine. I'll bet the liability, I mean, everything, it's liability, huge. legal, community impact, the, the perception of our industry. I mean, there's a lot at stake right there if that if that spill starts getting out and gets out of control, it's, it's massive. which we've seen in our industry nonstop every time there's a spill. And that's why we have this 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 narrative, again, other, other people writing our stories for us. They see Macondo, they see Valdez, they see these very isolated yep. events for the most part. And then the reputation precedes us, right? So, uh, for the most part, we're all super, very safe, environmentally conscious, and uh, proactive. I think I think that's the message that we, as an industry, need to communicate more. Not just oh, we we, we did this to fix this, but instead, like because of this, we allowed this to happen right. in a good way. Right. You know, we our impact is positive on the on the communities that we're that we're in versus oh, we had a, we had a. a a no shit moment and uh oops sorry we, we we handled it this way so it's kind of we need to be more i feel like more proactive and that's again the cliche word but it's true though we need to tell our story better i, I think so and I, th- I think it's uh you know our generation especially you know we, we've 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 seen the the you know the, the transition of let's just say power from you know the, the generation that preceded us you know and they didn't really care too much about what other people thought right. as much they, they were there to do a job and great if they talk about this and that but they, they were laser focused on Well, the exposure wasn't there. The internet wasn't there. It's not in your face constantly. You're not getting alerts about a, a news story. Sure. And, yeah. And the, and the social pressure wasn't there. We, we, we've grown up in a different world. And I do think it's up to, you know, our generation to sort of promote, hey, you know, if you go on a drilling rig, it's probably the safest place, you know, you could be or you wouldn't be there yeah. for the most part. There's accidents happen, but there are some facilities and rigs and companies that are, you know, years about incidents. Right. And uh, it's because they're doing a very complicated, very dangerous process and they've got a lot of uh, safety protocols in place. We need to shake off that 1980s, 1970s uh, stigma that we have. There were just these wildcatters going out there, spinning chains, and, and that's a tough guy thing to talk about. It too, is. But, it is. But it's uh, it's just not it's just not relative to how it is now. No, it's not. And that's why I, I had a podcast with the Tyler Thomason over at uh, Encore Permian. I'm like, well, you know, what myth would you want to debunk? And he's mm-hmm. like, the whole macho ness of it. If you if you want to see your if you want to go to your kid's birthday, go. You know what I mean? Oh, you don't yeah. have to be on a re- like. It was it was an interesting conversation because yeah. it's true. Like the whole like macho, like oh man, I miss you know my daughter's birth. It's like, well, that's not good. No, <laughs> you no, want to be there for that. And that's why it, 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 that's what I thought the industry was when I first you know, when I was growing up. My dad was, was twenty one twenty one on twenty one off, and yeah, it was uh, not something I wanted to particularly do. But again, this industry has changed so much. Automated walking rigs, electric top drives, you know. Pretty much, they're going to be controlling these things from shore at some point oh, yeah. you know, with automation and the way it's going. So I, I think our industry should segue very well with safety, environmental, and you know, multi fuel future. That I think is very possible. Yeah. And it is happening. It is happening. That's yeah. the thing, though. There's, we just got to tell that story, though. It's right. up to us. Yes. So uh, anyway, Brandon, I appreciate you coming in today, man. Again, everyone, this is uh, Brandon. Uh, Brizard, um, you see it is. Yeah, I want to hit that E. Brandon Brizard, uh, the Vice President of Global Business Development at Lamore Corporation, and you can find him on LinkedIn, and you can also check out uh, Lamore Corporation on LinkedIn. Check out their website, um, and I uh, appreciate you coming in, man. I appreciate uh, your insight, kind of what drives you, what's motivating you, um, and uh, kind of what you're doing. Uh, being an industry advocate and uh i i, I wish you the best once the kind of things open up and uh i'd love to get you back on and kind of talk about what's your role now that you can move that you can get out of katy texas <laughs> well this has been an absolute blast and thank you for being such a great oh, voice for yeah, thanks for coming, I, think, dude. I think it's people like you that are going to shape uh the real narrative around mm. what, what we're happening and what's doing so uh i really appreciate being on and Best of luck to you as well. Well, buddy, I'm very flattered for those words, and I appreciate it. But uh, we'll talk to you soon. And, uh, again, check them out. Uh, hook up with them, link, uh, send them a message. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in on uh, Round the Road, and we'll see you next time. Da, 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 I'm lo- Hold on a second. No, you're good. No, you're good. All right. Bye.